Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode. Um, I might have to relocate in the middle of this, but uh, I'm going to get into it. Roar, uh, what was it called? Choices that roared into the universe. Our choices, our choices, our choices. appear to be the fingers that program where the feet can go. You know, I was looking at how civilizations rise and fall and how we are one civilization and the universe could be so potentially old that we don't know how many civilizations have lived on this earth. You know, it's as if we have opened our eyes in escape room of a cosmic size. <laughs> I found myself in myself an interesting emotion in 2014 and before I started these talks the idea of the talk actually I had it for a SoundCloud page called Mr. Within's Dream which later on became the Deep Ambient Project but the idea was that there was a moment where I had to decide what I wanted and I could tell you of course a human being growing in this world there's certain things you can choose certain things you can't choose certain things you will walk towards and they will walk away from you but certain things you walk towards they will run towards you you know and so this was one of those I would say it was an algorithm to my moment in 2014 that there was something presented by my inner realms that there was a choice there was a choice to pay attention to a sort of inner realm emotion an emotion based on internal uh, content based on subjective content and emotions based on objective content usually we are an objective being and then we think of subjects correct but this was more like I was a subjective being that my inner realms had a validity to me that means my mind showed me the aftermath of my work in a subconscious way <clears throat> that means I wouldn't be surprised if a human being consciously can maybe think about uh, two-thirds of the problem but uh, uh, in their subconscious maybe they've actually completed the problem maybe they've had multiple solutions to it so the issue is not just uh, educating the species it is getting the species access to its own education to its subconscious which seemed to me one of the most fascinating ideas that there is more behind our eyes which we have to find ways of exploring really and by the way anyone hearing those pops in the background it's fireworks you know I don't know why but <laughs> I guess some people are celebrating my talk from a distance. Yeah. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that the, the choice I had to make that ended up becoming this channel who people are listening to, it wasn't an objective realm focused endeavor. It was like the roar of the mind into matter rather than a material intention hopefully becoming mind after a you know. You, you, it, it depends. Um, the energy you start is very important. You know, I, I can tell you that when I write a sentence, how I write the first words suggests the honor of the last words that get, I get to. That means if I'm writing something and my handwriting ba is bad for the first couple of words, then suddenly my respect for the whole sentence is low because I have started from a low point. You know? 
So when it comes to choices, it is a sort of inner declaration of how the conscious is engaging the unconscious. <clears throat> Usually the way our conscious uh, attention engages the unconscious is through form, through information. We feel we are information, literally our cells are, uh, you know, uh, complex protein structures. But the thing is, it's kind of like somebody looking at biological evolution, objective evolution, and being like, hey, evolution, what are you doing? It's like, why did you turn yourself into a mind? You know, <laughs> you know matter somehow evolved towards a mind. How phenomenal. <laughs> the universe cared about brains. Do you believe that? The universe cared about creaturehood. Because it seems such a vast process that the moment you see it as, as one cosmic activity, the small doesn't make sense. That's the thing um, uh, of the idea of the fractal, that when you look at the macrocosm, you're actually seeing the microcosm. When you're looking at the microcosm, you're actually looking at the macrocosm. That we have different dimensions of acknowledging the vastness of something, but that means in different angles, that vastness can change. <clears throat> that means to a human being, they look at the pyramids in Egypt and they're like, oh my God, you know, there, there's no way human beings move these rocks, you know? You know, um, somebody right now in the chat section has said, holy smokes, Batman, if they took the B away, it would be holy smokes, Atman. <laughs> so Batman needs to become aware of the Atman. <laughs> It's like some guy went to India, a yogi came out of a cave, and he's like, is that Batman? He's like, no, that's the Atman. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. <clears throat> the Atman, guys, is a word in Vedic thought, which means the individual soul. Who knew adding a B to the Atman, you become Batman. You know, so I could say, uh, Atman with ego equals Batman. Batman without ego equals Atman. There's a story which recently I've made a point of it to share it often. It's a story of a man who goes to a forest and he is incredibly hopeless in his life. That means you can say all human beings make decisions. Now, whether they are conscious decisions, unconscious decisions, it's a different thing because of the nature uh, of this universe being entropic because you see that it's a play of various forces that means choices are all the time being made even not making a choice is strangely a choice
you know, let's take this angle that all of reality is the movement of information the simplest definition that means the child goes and asks uh, the parents uh, let us say the future generations children go and ask their parents what is this place you know one of the healthiest things that the uh, the parent of uh, a parent can say is that it's a uh, happening it's a movement it's an event it's an event that if you care for life you will be alive in it if you don't care for life you will become lifeless in it that is really this event there has been times where I haven't listened to my intuition and it's literally been as if the skies have scolded me the skies of my karma have scolded me and there's been times where I have listened to my intuition and it was as if I played a part in my own existence that's the thing that's the thing where it's as if you know Socrates spoke about an inner oracle <clears throat> And so intuition is important. Sometimes it, that you can say the unconscious mind communicates with the conscious mind, the same mind the conscious mind is attempting to communicate with the unconscious mind. But anyways, I'll tell you the story. Pretty much this guy is hopeless. He goes into the forest. This is back in the day, you know, way back in the day where there were Gnostic priests, the original Gnostic priests and whatnot. <clears throat> and so what happens... This man is hopeless. He is broken. He is shattered. He has been rejected by life, by the forces of life. And he goes to, he, so he goes to this forest and he shouts to the universe because he, entered, he, he, he believed in God. And he says, God, give me a sign. What is this? Why am I oh, broken? Why am I, why is there no door open for me? You know? And so the guy goes, asks the universe, the, the nature of the world, the nature of his realm. The guy asks for a sign, and he goes and he goes into the forest. And as he's walking into the forest, he suddenly sees something. Remember the stories back in the day. Uh, as he as he goes into the forest, he sees something that he can't believe. It's as if it is such an oddity of nature that he covers his eyes in shock. Do you know? Imagine, it's, it's like when you see, for example, in movies, the characters see something inhumane and they can't fathom it, just like an ostrich that is overwhelmed. The ostrich puts its head in the dirt. Similarly, a human being that can't look at something that is too unfathomable, they cover their eyes. So this man covers his eyes. He sees something in nature after asking the universe for a sign. Uh, and what he sees is a wolf without legs. And it, and it freaks him out because he's like, how the hell is this wolf alive without legs? You know, how's it been hunting? How's it alive? <clears throat> and so in that situation, the guy's staring at this war, uh, wolf, this miracle, this, this unfathomable phenomena to him and he suddenly sees there is a growl of a lion and he sees something he's never seen a lion with food in its mouth is coming towards the wolf the guy quickly gets on a tree and looks at it you know looks at the situation and the lion comes up to the limbless wolf the wolf that doesn't have any legs comes to the limbless wolf and puts a chunk of meat in front of the limbless wolf and leaves and the wolf starts to feast and this man this man who was hopeless who felt uh, he could go nowhere. He looks at this limbless wolf and he's like, holy shit, the universe is giving me a sign. You know, he gets super emotional and he's like, I am the wolf and God gave me a sign. God is going to send me, you know, uh, a lioness to give me meat. <laughs> you know, and so the guy's, the guy's looking at the situation and he's like, God is the lion. I am the limbless wolf. And he, it's as if he suddenly goes back to town and he stops. Instead of caring to live on, he just sits on the side of the road, this grown man, and doesn't do anything. He's like, I'm the limbless wolf. Oh, God is going to help me. I don't need to do anything. The man stays there for a while. A Gnostic priest is passing by. The Gnostic priest, as he's walking by, he suddenly sees there's this grown man sitting on the ground and he, he so, there's something odd about it. And he just stands there and just stares at the guy. Then the Gnostic priest shouts to the guy and says, stand up. As if, like, why are you, why are you lying on the ground? You know? <clears throat> 
and the guy stands up, you know, and he goes, runs to the Gnostic priest, and he's like, priest, I made a prayer, I went to the forest, I saw a sign, you know, and he tells the whole story, and he's like, priest, that was a divine message, like, why hasn't God helped me, Do you know? I'm this limbless wolf waiting here, the creation of this almighty God. Why hasn't God helped me? You know, wasn't that a divine sign? How rare is that to see a limbless wolf be fed by a lion? That must have been a sign. The Gnostic priest looks at this man, this hopeless man, and says, Hey man, you got one part of it right. <laughs> he says, you got it right that it was a divine message. It was something that you were meant to see. But what you didn't get right is that God and the universe didn't show you that lion and wolf for you to think you are the limbless wolf, but for you to be the lion. To be the lion. What does that mean? That means you could be in any situation of life, looking at a sky with sun, looking at the starry sky with sunglasses and wondering why it's dim. But you will see there is a force. The answer to our prayers is within us. <clears throat> it is instant. The moment you can fathom, you can access. At least on your inner realms until you bring it to your outer realms. Some things can't be brought, like they don't have an authorization. Think about the inner realms of the human being as a world where there is more authorization. It's unconditional. So the guy's like, oh my God, I was meant to be the lion. How silly of me thinking I'm this limbless wolf in this world that I'm here once. <laughs> <clears throat> that means even if you are a limbless wolf, think like a lion. I honestly think this person's wasting their fireworks. Okay. <laughs> like it's not even that dark yet, you know?
so so guys I mean I've, I've just started the lecture nobody's missed anything um, I was just looking at the chat section <clears throat> usually I build the context before I really get to the context concept of the main concepts I want to speak about pretty much <clears throat> I, I feel that human expression has two options like it's happening either way that means you can choose not to in this life for example, live in a certain way, but you see you're still left as being alive. So you see life is happening. There is a existence, a per existential purpose to phenomena where it is just being what it is. Like when I think about um, like why there should be birds building a nest and like what value does it have to society, like, you know. You know, I can't see, like, for example, a bird making a nest may not help civilization, like the human civilization, but it still existentially has a purpose of design. That means many of us think that a designed creature should have a, a certain design of a life purpose, but there are certain schools of thought that see the design as the purpose just being like you know it's like when the person drew a painting he didn't draw the painting so the painting does something the painting was what it what it is you know I can say that the, the Bhagavad Gita has this perfect metaphor where I can't tell you how many times in this life I have actually experienced this certain even dangerous situations in my life where only it was as if like my brain was an antenna and it managed to pick the right signal in time. You know, in the Bhagavad Gita it says that the, the body is like the horse's the mind that administers the body is like the chariot driver and the soul which is hidden to the chariot driver is the person sitting in the chariot now there is this idea that the chariot driver has already spoken has already spoken to <clears throat> the chariot driver has already spoken to the person in the chariot and the, that means the it's it's poetically like your soul has already told your mind what to do but when your mind falls asleep, poetically, the soul from inside the chariot comes and is like, hey, mind, get your, get your body in order. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> so I feel there is an exchange. There is an exchange between a field of intelligence and a particular intelligence. You know, there are certain schools of thought don't just see it as... They, some schools of thought see the mind as uh, the effect of the soul. You know, but certain schools of thought see the mind as separate, completely separate. Do you know that means when Rene Descartes was like, wait a minute, is the mind in its own dimension and the body is in its own dimension, the mind-body dualism, in mystical thought, they were like, yo, buddy, this mind that even you think is infinite, in its own dimension, there's even more than that. You know, so certain schools of thought have surpassed image and form, a form-based realism, and certain schools of thought, they can't. Because the moment they go out of form, it's as if they go out of design. Guys, I will. I just saw something in the chat section. I really don't want to play with the settings of this too much <clears throat> uh, because I don't think there is that option. But uh, <clears throat> I don't think there's a quality option. Oh, stream latency. The latency is normal, you know. But uh, 
anyways. <clears throat> Guys, in life, let me tell you, sometimes desires can spike. Sometimes you may want something to happen in a certain way. What tends to happen there is that your inner realms gives you a version of the moment, but then if you actually look at the moment and treat life as alive, the livelihood of the moment also moves you, you know, directs you. That means there's been certain times where I could say my decision was not intellectual and it was the right decision. It was more of like a feeling the vibe because you, you can make an intellectual and rational decision if you have the known variables. Any system that has unknown variables, whatever amount of rationalism you, you apply, you're going to see there's something about the picture that you didn't see before. So there's elements to the rationality that aren't known before. <clears throat> Anyways, guys, I'm, I'm going to do something. I'm going to go, I'm going to relocate. Uh, it might actually help the stream so I'll be back okay but pretty much what I wanted to say is don't chase the butterfly just be still and the answer comes to you if you want the answer in a hurried way then it's as if you haven't understood that the question needs patience you know patience of mind sometimes a question has to dissolve in the mind before it can like one of those vitamin uh, you know tablets that kind of get infused with the water when you put it in <laughs> Yeah. That's what a question needs to do with the mind. Yeah. But anyways, guys, I'll be back. Blessings. Okay, so um, sorry, folks, I had to relocate. Um, so let's get, let's really dive into it. Um, <clears throat> this concept of a roar, it's pretty much the expression of the human being throughout the lifetime. Uh, there is a world behind our eyes, and there is a world in front of our eyes, and that's how it's starting off. That means when we look in front of our eyes it's as if imagination you already have thought of poetically or freely given imagination that means on in one angle we could see it as there being reality and imagination being unreal or we could see reality being um imagination being reality unreal do you know We have a self in a world. Now, the self is considering a known dimension to itself and an unknown dimension. And the world is considering a known dimension to itself and an unknown dimension. Now, when the world is unknown and the self is unknown, that is the mystic. That equals mysticism. When the self is unknown and the world is known I would say we can say that is when the self is known and the world is unknown that means you feel like a self in an unknown world yeah okay here we can do it like this <clears throat> um, the religious person, uh, we can say the self is known, 
the self is the self is known sorry guys I, I gotta just draw this grid there's variables to this there we go known known unknown unknown There we go. I got it here. Unknown, unknown self, known world, and there we go. Unknown self, unknown world. By the way, guys, anybody listening um, to these these talks, you got to realize I'm treating these. Um, talks also as a digit as an archive of my own work so sometimes i may be sharing stuff that is not necessarily to the topic but it's something that i want to keep alive for the for, uh, for, for the next day or whatever <clears throat> so people can casually you can tune in tune out this is like just an event that's happening you can and uh you know uh, leave the room whenever you want but the idea is we have a known self, we have a known world, you know, we have a known self, we have an unknown world, we have an unknown self, we have a known world, and then we have an unknown self and an unknown world. The unknown self and the unknown world, that is the mystical reality. That's usually where I, if, if you pay attention, if you listen to me long enough, you'll see that I am wondering about new contexts to the self, to the idea of the self, and to the idea of the world. And wondering how experience is like the hands of the sculptor when it comes to uh, the, the inner realms and subjective phenomena. It's like sometimes what the inner realms appear to be is how the outer realm echoed in a different, in a different way, in a, in, into a different dimension. <clears throat> the known self and the known world... This means we, this is literally, I would say, um, if the self was known and the world was known, we'd be God or infinity, completely. If the self is known and the world is unknown, we'd be human. <laughs> if the self is unknown and the world is known, we would be a collective being. There we go. We'd be a collective being, and uh, that means our world would be more intelligent than ourself. You know, if, if you consider, like right now, you as a human being can stop doing anything. And you know who's going to become your leader? The world. The world is going to move you if you don't move yourself in the world. This is the nature, this is the, like the law of this universe, you know. If you don't, if you don't put your foot on the gas, you know it's uh, like you're gonna go into the passenger seat, and a lot of other forces in life are gonna live for you. You know, when it comes to ideology, like I remember looking into Shintoism. Shintoism is a very unique Japanese um, and a bit archaic, um, you can say religion. Let's even even though the word religion in, in <clears throat> and as uh, in Japanese culture is is not translated the same, I would say. But what I'm what I'm saying is in Shintoism, there's this idea that all objective phenomena is a vessel for a highway of souls. That means like like the Buddhist is like. Uh, being like, all right, I got different incarnations to deal with, you know, I'm going to keep reincarnating or something. And to a Buddhist person, especially, you know, reincarnation isn't a good thing. <laughs> Do you know, that means like, um, <clears throat> anyways, so we would see the Buddhist, the Buddhist or, or, or the yogi is like, okay, this transmigrating eternal soul through this temporality. But then you see the, sh the person looking at Shinto is like, who says it's one soul? Who says you're one soul? Do you know? That means there's this view that we are trying to personify the unknown and call it soul. 
The same thing we did when we looked at the sky and we personified it. People saw God in the 6th century. The same way now we're personifying the inner sky as our soul. So in, in Shintoism, it was this vast, this very fascinating idea that like you can look at, it's like all matter is a vessel, as if, as if there is a highway of souls occupying the body of a dimension, you know, as if like this cup of, you know, not this cup, this cup, <laughs> this cup of coffee I have in my hand, you know, it's as if like, it's like whether through this cup of coffee or whether through me, an endless a highway, highway of intelligence. Right now we are tend to we tend to classify it. We're like, yeah, it's just me here. You know, but this me is made of everything else. It's made of the periodic table. It is an elemental position. That means it's like we're at a very fascinating point where never before have we seen this amount of atoms uh, doubt their origin. For me, I thought it's, it's kind of strange because even though on an atomic level, I mean, you can't really compare an atom, you know, with another atom, you know. It's like this atom is more cooler than that other atom, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> the atoms even considered 99.9% .9 empty, you know. That means, believe it or not, our world is built on emptiness. Fascinating, no? Just like when you look at Dubai, Dubai is a fascinating place. If people look at Dubai, the first question they should ask is how could they build such an incredible city and the uh, tallest tower in the world on sand? How could they build it on sand? And actually, if you go look at it to the architecture of the city, they have built these really long, I think, what is it, like 300 meters into the ground. So they have dug into the sand. So many people don't realize that it, it, the structures in Dubai, it's as if their foundations are super deep, you know? So it's, it's something similar, where what's in the surface are oh, adorable, cute, once in a lifetime, but what is really in the foundations has been, uh, you can say, brewing for eons. So for me, it, it's like I was thinking, so if Shintoism is saying it's a highway of souls, that means the manifest world is a road for higher dimensional beings. And guys, just to finish the idea, I believe Shintoism is something that's going to archaically revive when people connect their heads to the same computer. I feel we are, we, we got signs from nature. It was as if, here's the thing, it's like first something unconscious is designed, then this unconscious design becomes conscious of its design, okay? So that means first we live in not knowing, then we can know, interestingly. You see, they say you need to have balance in life, but when it comes to knowledge, are the people of this planet having balance? Are they chasing just the outer realms for clarity, or are they just chasing the inner realms for the clarity, or have they noticed that life surpasses the events of their conception? That means there was a point where I was like, what if I'm wrong? 
What if everybody else is wrong? What if the whole universe is wrong? And what if even whatever, whatever led to, to this whole thing is wrong? I was just, it was like a situation where, you know, when somebody says you're wrong and you're like, hey man, I'm wrong. What about you? What if, what, what, how about you are wrong? You know? And it's like, but I, I was having that situation with the cosmos where I was, it's like, I, I felt I was looking at the cosmos wrong. Then I was like, maybe the cosmos doesn't know any better. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, imagine there's this little kid somewhere in the world. This little kid goes out and it's like uh, raining. And the little kid's like, rain, get out of here, man. I want to play outside. And the rain suddenly comes and says, I apologize. I didn't know you could see me. <laughs> what I mean by that is that elemental forces were personified back in the day. Right now, like you see how people look at their pets and they don't just see an animal there. They see like a family member there, you know. So, so it's, it's the same thing that we're looking at something that is not like weather. It is not animate, but if we saw man being in control of his universe, it would grant personality. That means there was an incredible scene in Iron Man where Tony Stark was talking to Jarvis. Just that scene, you know, like, you know, people might, re <laughs> they, may, they may be like, was that Mr. Within's favorite scene in, in, in like the, uh, you know, Iron Man films? And I'll be like, yeah, well, the dude was talking to a personality that was tech based. That means right now we don't talk to our computers. I mean, there is Siri, Siri and Alexa. Those are incredible advancements people may not realize, <clears throat> regardless of the questionability of their honesty. But what I'm telling you, they are incredible advancements that our creation is given a voice. I mean, think about it. People raise children and the children, uh, they, they teach the child behavior and the environment also raises the child. <clears throat> Everything the child sees, that means people like every, it's like, it's like Khalil Gibran says, your children are not your children because they have their own eyes, because they're their own intelligent factor, you know? And I'll tell you, the biggest source of discrimination on this planet has been not realizing the unknown within the other. It's so easy to hate when you think you see it all. It's so easy. It's so easy to, to honestly judge if you feel certain. But here's the thing. The honest being cannot have 100% certainty here. And the reason is, is because it's a dynamic and changing system. And most people, they don't realize it's a changing system. It's a changing system where we arise through a, a certain uh, condition of evolution. You know, there was this idea, I'm like, <clears throat> I, I, I was looking into yoga and meditation, and this, you know, this was, of course, years ago. I was looking into it and I'm like, wait a minute, are all these people going towards silence and stillness? Like, is that the common denominator? And you go see in any meditative practice in anywhere in the world, there was a sense of slowing down, being silent and still and watching. That means many people don't realize when you go to the movies and you're watching a film, that's like a legit meditative state, you know? <laughs> You know, you are silently witnessing that which you know you are not. <clears throat> and I'm like, what are these yogis doing? Trying to watch their mind like films to realize they're not that film on the screen? And so that common denominator of stillness and silence, and I was like, okay, wait a minute. You know, there was a time it was very beautiful. I mean, I, I still honor um, the teachings of Sri Ramanamarshi, but, but I'm telling you, there is something that is worth it in this life and there is something that isn't worth it. And it all comes down to how much you have cared to be natural. You know, if you think about it, silence and stillness and yes, those really help in a busy civilization that's tormenting itself over its expectation of the future, sure. 
go and meditate your way out of uh, the hells you create. But I'm telling you that when life is no longer a story, that's when it's actually begun. That's when you're actually life sensitive. You see it. <clears throat> There's this video I was seeing earlier today on YouTube and it was showing good sportsmanship. <clears throat> and, you know, you would see like th these people running, you know, you would see these people running in this, in this marathon, like sprinting marathon, and suddenly one person, their legs would give up. You know, I saw like this, um, it, it, it was this woman's uh, sprint, not sprint, like marathon running in the streets or whatever. And, the, and this lady, she couldn't run anymore, you know, and this younger girl comes and helps her up, you know. And it was this situation where you see it's as if like you don't, you can't expect it from the person about to be first place to help the world. You can't expect it from the second, but maybe you can expect it from the person who's going to be third. That means I would say that here's, it's like the opportunity cost. That person in the finish line, he's like, well, hey man, I'm in the finish line. I'm just going to go get to the finish line. I'm not going to help this person who's fallen beside me. The second person is like, hey man, I could at least be second. Let me, let me go to the finish line. The third person is like, I'm fucking third. All right, I'm going to help this person. Yeah. <laughs> so it is, it is, I am telling you, it is not the leaders. It is not the well off that can help. It is those that are in third place that will save civilization. I will tell you. Those people who are in third place, they can see uh, civilization bleeding. Those in first and second cannot. And life is incredible because any human being, whoever you are, whatever you're doing, just endure and you will laugh. You will laugh that if you just continue, if, if you realize that really it's pretty, like I don't really mention that much in, this, in these talks, but if you really wanted my honest analysis of what life is, it's incredibly binary. What does that mean? That means there's effort, no effort. That is me. That means if, you, if, if anybody listening, you want to know how I judge myself, I'm like, did I move that day? <laughs> Or did I not move? Did I live for something that was real to me? God damn it. Or did I just hover and exist? Exist in, in the absence of my own expectation. I remember there was um, in, uh, some visions that I, I feel that can't, I can't really relate to modern times. I, I keep it in my science fiction. And I'm, I'm going to share with you a chapter from my science fiction, which is one of the most personal. That means I could tell you when I wrote this chapter, there was like an unknown tear on my face. Do you know, as if like the tear of something that was massive. You know what, I'm, what it means? It's like for me, it's not that I, 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 I walk in a school of thought that both the secular and the religious are going to be like, who is this guy? You know, <laughs> because I say that this, the soul doesn't have a personality, that we reach a certain point in our evolution where we have to put down the idea of self not because it's like we're trying to get to somewhere better. The Andromedan pilot. Guys, I'll do my best. I, I don't think I can remember all of it exactly, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. If it was a movie, this chapter... So first of all, I, I've written this giant science fiction novel. It's still in the progress of you know, being complete. I don't know if I, if it's possible for me to even finish it in this year, but it, it's like this giant science fiction novel where I've given my inner realms complete freedom of expression. And so it's set in the year, uh, 5,025. <clears throat> and, uh, there's different parallel realities. There's like nine parallel, uh, earths, nine parallel, uh, versions of earth and there's a government in the story called the enlightened society that is the first multi-dimensional government of different uh parallel planes of 
human existence. You know, that means it's a government that is like taking care of not just one uh, di parallel dimension, but it's taking of like parallel, different parallel realities of Earth. Do you know that means if in one, one that means this, uh, like I wrote a chapter on it, this is different from the Andromedan pilot, but the, the enlightened society, this the government of it, first of all, it has an incredible story how it began, which I'm not going to share here, <laughs> but the idea, but the, <laughs> the idea of it, is, is simply that the enlightened society, by accessing parallel versions of Earth, found a way to manage the resources. But also the thing was, it had to also confront parallel governments, you know? <clears throat> so anyways, the Andromedan pilot. First of all, guys, in this science fiction novel, the Andromeda Galaxy is, I see the Andromeda Galaxy as the older brother, as the older brother of Milky Way. The older brother of the Milky Way Galaxy. So the Andromedans in my science fiction are an incredibly enlightened, as if just like how you see human beings got a head start, head start from uh, other animal species on this planet, for example, evolutionary speaking, you know. Similarly, head start or some intervention, but, but I'm telling you, it's like the Andromedans were, were the first, um, they, they are kind of known as the enlightened advanced civilization. So if you could see, imagine like those small green aliens you see in movies who are evil, they appear evil. So the Andromedans are opposite. They are the opposite. They're incredibly illuminated. They have like eons of wisdom ahead. Their nature. Their natures are way more crystallized than all, pretty much other galactic, uh, you know, of course this is a science fiction novel. I created the, the idea of them. But um, <clears throat> anyways, so the Andromedan pilot. Let's get into this chapter, guys. This is a good one. <clears throat> and I'll tell you the reason I'm sharing this is because Rumi says... Before death takes away all that is given, give away all there is to give. The value of art is just the beauty in the moment, really. Not its echo, per se. So, the scene begins with this human being in his 30s, I don't know, in his 30s, putting his hand on a giant rock, this strange-shaped rock in the middle of this grass field. This is the chapter, the Andromedan pilot, guys. Put, he puts his hand on, what do you call it? Uh, uh, on this rock, on this strange like meteor where it has grass and stuff on it. And you see, he's put his hand, and I got inspired by a picture I saw. This incredible artist had drawn this picture of this uh, World War veteran who was beside his, he was touching this wall, this black wall that was like with the names of his comrades who had died in battle. And in the reflection on that black stone of that memorial wall, you could see his comrades and uh, kind of touching the man's hand. So it's a very short chapter, by the way, this one. But the Andromedan pilot, uh, pilot um, the situation begins is that he is remembering an event. He touches the meteor, he remembers an event. Now, what is this event? The Andromedan pilot, I have created an evil species, alien species in this uh, science fiction novel of mine. They're called the Darkons, and they're spelled D-A-R-K-H-A-N. Why? Because Khan, the word in, in, uh, means landowner. The biggest landowner in villages was known as the Khan you know, so, uh, Khan, you know, K-H-A-N, and so, <clears throat> it was, uh, the Darkons were this unenlightened, but in incredibly technologically advanced civilization, and in the story, the way I saw them later, was, was like these giant insect-like creatures that have electricity and smog, around them. So when they invade planets, you, the plant people on the planet suddenly see this giant black spiral of, of smog and electricity. Then they suddenly realize there's these like terrifying insectoid kind of like 
evil species inside the cloud. You know, so they, they terrify the planet before invading it. Now, the Darkons are so advanced. In my story, I thought of something that I noticed, like, I haven't, I hadn't seen it. It was like this, it was just this idea that was uncommon where it was this soul destroyer. Usually, the idea of the soul is that it's beyond matter, so it can't be destroyed. But in, the, in my science fiction novel, this, uh, what do you call it? This species, evil species, had found a technological device, had created a technological weapon called the Soul Destroyer. Soul something, I don't know what I named it. But now the Andromedan pilot is this cargo ship. And little do we know in the story that the Andromedan pilot is the son of royalty. So he is the son of like the the like a certain emperor in the Andromeda galaxy, enlightened emperor. Uh, in the uh, in light, uh, Andromedan, uh, what do you call it? Uh, in the Andromedan galaxy. So the Andromedan pilot is this simple guy. It's like the young kid of a family, you know, royal family of galactic beings. And so the Andromedan pilot, it's a, he's in a cargo ship. He's the pilot and the Darkons, and they're right beside Earth. They're right beside Earth, and the Darkons shoot this soul-destroying weapon. Now, the idea is, if the being doesn't go out of their body, in, in my sci-fi story, I've given permission for this, if the being doesn't go out of their body before the weapon hits them, before the charge of the weapon hits them, their soul becomes eradicated. So the scene is, he is the only one, the, the Andromedan pilot who manages to get out of the ship and the soul destroyer, when it, the weapon hits his ship, everybody from his comrades to the love of his life and everything, they all eradicate and his soul, his body gets destroyed too. His soul goes and it fall, it, the karmic oversoul of the planet takes, adopts his soul. Do you know? And so what happens is he be incarnates as a human being. He gets his soul comes into the gravitational pull of the oversoul of the planet and is <clears throat> he incarnates as a child, human child, but he is so illuminated. He's such an enlightened being from the Andromeda galaxy that he remembers everything. He remembers everything. He knows exactly what has happened. Do you know? So he's like this 30-year-old guy who is actually this Andromedan pilot who was actually the son of this royalty of the Andromeda galaxy. Now the reason I created this chapter is because there is an event happening on Earth, which includes the Darkons. There's an event happening on Earth where uh, coincidentally, based on the destiny of the sci-fi story, this Andromedan pilot that is here, the Andromedans have to come back and save their royal son. So there comes a situation where coincidentally, the Andromedan galaxy's highest order comes to Earth in the middle of where Earth is being invaded. You know, these are earlier, f further on chapters, you know? <clears throat> And there's one character in the book named Rousseau, where this character, he is a character where you see as if like the author, like there's something that um, I can tell you, it was something I was blessed to learn from my brother, but that the character in the book can also have a relationship the character in your novel can have a relationship with the author. You are the author. Do you know? What I mean by that is that in, in the science fiction novel, there's moments where my will, my free will, regardless of how the story is going, comes and saves the character. You know? <laughs>
sorry guys, I'm being a bit uh, distracted here. Just hang on. Okay, so where were we? <laughs> yeah, guys, pretty much this idea with the Andromeda and Pilot is that there is a memory that surpasses the reality for the memory was of a greater reality. I feel that <clears throat> when we look at the choices that human beings have to make, their choices are all movement and speech that means this is a good riddle what are the two what are two ways that image can travel i would say through sound and light <clears throat> sound and light are information carrier systems and the information they carry right now my voice is carrying the information from my inner realms to the outer realms Our choices is how we, through silence, allow sound to emerge. And uh, how, through light, we allow movement to mean something.
Sri Ramana Maharshi says, silence is also a conversation. If our choices appear through movement and sound, and movement and sound appear as light carrying information, I think it's fair to say that the healthiest way to look at the human being is that it's an event. <clears throat> it's an event where the attention can identify as the one who's causing the event, the attention can identify as being the effect of the event, the attention can identify as just observing the event. That means every relationship to any idea we have, it is an interpretation uh, or it's a model upon movement. For me, my decisions, when I really look at them, I'm, not, I'm like, okay, let me see. What are like some choices that have felt like roars to me? Roars of the soul as the mind into the body. Just events that I felt part of the prime mover of the moment. I would say that. Because isn't it fascinating that every human being has a different DNA, they have a different upbringing, and then they have, you know, different exposure to what the world means to them? It's as if we are all biological information processors. <clears throat> and I'm like, why would nature need to process information? Why? Why are we seeing that part? Like right now, I don't think about my heart, it just beats. But why is it that the person has to think about like moving their physical body or thinking about what exactly uh, their precision should be in the work or whatnot? So, so I'm saying that it's, it's fascinating that why these buttons are put placed in front of us that we can choose to click on and why so many other buttons of nature, it's not in the domain of our free will. So the first thing to realize in this life, I think more important than desiring something, like it's okay to desire, but Mr. Within is saying before you desire, observe. <clears throat> observe the true meaning and value of phenomena because when the Buddha did this the Buddha looked at an object and he's like wait a minute wait a minute is the nature of this object empty and I'm just looking at it and giving it a nature you know and Objective phenomena is colored by the experiencer within. The experiencer within, I thought it was a story. I thought it was a story inside a story. I thought for the longest time it was a unique narrative. That means it's like what heaven was or what the higher dimensions could be or what the peak of evolution throughout the eons would be was just simply something that seemed in my youth to be a story I haven't heard yet, but will have, will I will hear someday. Then the biggest uh, uh, mind-shattering moment of my life was when I was like, wait a minute, how am I being my name? That in deep sleep, we are no one. And no one can suffer. It's only in our wakefulness where the individual design is set in motion that we suffer. So the cool thing is when it's too dark to see, you can't see the suffering. So the sensation is meaningless. It's fascinating. It's like we have been as under the assumption we are chess pieces on a chessboard. And we're like, yeah, the chessboard's here, like my foot's on it. 
you know? <laughs> and you're like, yeah, I'm definitely a chess piece. I'm part of civilization, just a character in this vast story. <clears throat> but what if it wasn't a story? What if you had lied to yourself when you thought you were your name? When you thought you could just be a set of words in the void? You think it's that easy, you know, you think a, a person says, I'm, you know, I'm Superman, you know, and suddenly you think they become Superman, you know, it's like just because you feel super. <laughs> <clears throat> I remember in one of my, in, in this hilarious situation, this was uh, in one of my talks where I remember I laughed so hard after the talk. I just as, as ended the talk and I was just, just like giggling for like, uh, you know, an unnecessary long time, you know, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> the thing was, was that I envisioned that it was a situation where Batman and Robin and Superman, they had gone to this enlightened yogi, you know, and the yogi, you know, had told Superman something like as if you got to sit down and you got to realize that the world is super before you are, you know. And then there was something where I had brought, I don't remember the figures. I don't know if it was, ah, you know what's interesting, guys? Some memories, um, their residue is an emotion, and you know. <clears throat> I think emotional, because the child doesn't speak, first there's an emotional language. This is why somebody, they say, people remember how you make them feel, not what you say. And I was like, I hope not, <laughs> I'm saying, you know, but, uh, <clears throat> but the thing is that there's an emotional intelligence and field. And I feel we are fields before we are particles in the field. Because if you're a dualistic creature, duality has nowhere to go other than eternally be broken and fixed. That means it's like when you're in the hamster wheel, it doesn't matter, you're in the wheel. You know, it's like, that's the Buddha was saying this, the wheel of karma, the wheel of constantly space, a reaction to space to be matter and a reaction to matter to be space. Isn't it hilarious? It's like, I've, I've heard stories that are like the opposite of the metaphysics we hear now. What does that mean? That means just like individual beings want to go to a collective state of enlightenment, there are collective beings who can't wait to come into an individual state of ignorance. You know, <laughs> because the opportunity is not rational or ideological, it's experiential. That means when you see an animal and you put two different foods in front of that animal, wild animal, the animal doesn't go, okay, let me see which one I like, you know, let me see which one looks cool, you know. The animal just goes based on its instincts, its senses. And we are living in a society that is desensitizing us. That means people are depending less on their own natural senses and they are depending on their unnatural senses, which is the technological intimacy that keeps increasing and increasing. <clears throat> Life can be a simulation if you let it be. Remember that. What is the world but the opportunity of a breath in a moment? You know, I, I sometimes wonder, like, how long can a man speak about his inner realms before he realizes to the within there is no within? That our eyes will perish, but what they see may never. There is uh, elegance to living which every day I wonder about. I wonder about if the civilization can wear its cap in a cooler way. 
<clears throat> there's so many kinds of human beings that uh, if you thought of humanity as a brain, well, guess what? The neurons are there. The neurons are just not moving or they're not communicating. And if we treat humanity like a brain, imagine we design society like a brain. And I had this idea where I said that the most, the one of the best backup systems we can have to protect the natural from the unnatural is by uh, creating instead of the tree. You know how we say there is a tree of knowledge. How we see like knowledge is brand. There's branches of knowledge as a tree as a tree that has branched out, I am saying we have to replace that tree with the human body. The day a child can look at his hand and comprehend five fields of, uh, five branches of knowledge instantly, like we have to use biological and natural metaphors. I feel that, like, here's the thing. <clears throat> it's like, I mean, I, I don't have enough information on the medical sciences, but if there's doctors out there, you know, it's like you use you use patterns you see in in the importance of medical science and you share them because you see children, their survival is no longer dependent. It's not like a hunter gatherer situation anymore. You know, that means because the civilization has become weaker in inner character, the civilization has to make up for the blind spot of the being. You know, right now it's it's weird. It's like it's like the people are weak instead of the civilization raising them. The civilization is like, all right, but you gotta still, you know, <clears throat> regardless of if you're dying or not, be be on work on time tomorrow. Regardless if you die or not, be at work. Yeah. <laughs> So we are living in a civilization that is prioritizing something else more valuable than human sensitivity. We will speak a language, a humanitarian language as 8 billion people when we realize to be a human being doesn't mean you are just one moment or one shape or one story. It means you are part of the massive event that we call life. There was this poet Rumi, uh, when he passed away, I think it's written on his tomb or something, he said something in the sense like, don't you dare cry. Something like celebrate. Celebrate because I have, I have finished my walk in, in the garden of this human dimension. Because it is really a walk. <clears throat> Especially if you consider yourself a timeless being beyond the dimensions of time, then it's like it's like uh, you just put your head underwater for a second and you thought that was like however amount of years you lived on this man. You know? <laughs> doesn't get more mystical than that, folks, you know? If it gets more mystical than that, then it doesn't become individual. You see, we think what is um, beyond human intelligence to be something that moves without human intelligence. Do you know? <clears throat> Guys, I just noticed an incredible comment in the chat section. Charles says, is intent the author of the narrative? Attention is the author of intent. Attention can also simultaneously be without direction. But most human beings don't understand that idea because we want our lives to be directed in a certain way. We, we are not comfortable staring at the unknown as the unknown. Very few people can be the unknown. Let me tell you why. And not, I don't want to say very few people, but I'm saying that the reason it's, it's like a very rare antenna frequency, you know? 
<clears throat> Let me tell you why. Because it, it means a detachment from the concept of self. Uh, uh, and the only way I would say uh, those people who manage to uh, reach that, reach the unknown self and the unknown world are those that they have memories of being the unknown world. So if you don't have the memories, if you don't have the familiarity, you overwhelm yourself when you want to navigate in your inner realms to a conception that is like, let me, here's the thing, it's hilarious. It's like the mind is building the life before it lives it. So if you don't have that blueprint before you move, then the movement doesn't have mind. Because what is mind? It's structure. What is, uh, what is structure? It is the language in our, in our experience. Right now, how am I speaking to you? How am I giving a voice to my inner realms? You know? <clears throat> Through sound. I am externalizing an inner event as an outer event. So look at how fascinating that when you come to share something, you are co-creating again the idea. Charles says, metaphorical mutation empowers us, whether a limit or a creative guideline is a choice. Yes, I would say, first of all, interesting concept, metaphorical mutation. I would say that's epigenetics. That means it's just like how like your p people outside of you, the society outside of you influences your genetics. It's as if metaphors uh, uh, affect your decisions, so your decisions eventually affect your genetics to some degree. You know, I would say they affect the potential of your genetics. Maybe that's a safer way to speak about the idea, more, more of a better way. I don't know. I think the inconceivable will make most beings cry. But it will make them cry not because their known is about to end, but their unknown is about to begin. You know, I, I think I talked about it, you know, <clears throat> as hidden angles of the mind. That, that I felt that's what the concept of the angel was a way to look at the world through a certain light beam. Because really it's as if like I, I, I remember one day I looked in the mirror and I was like, wow, all this atomic existence is like a statue that has been kept by my for now. And you know what it feels like? I felt what houses, if they were conscious and demolished, would feel like. But I felt the thing that demolishes the house is time. And so I suddenly had this feeling as if uh, my, con my attention is, is like an Airbnb in, in the body. Now, when I say in the body, it's very complex because even philosophers have challenged this. You can, it's not something that can only be challenged on a <clears throat> materialistic level. It's something that it's as if like um, some people see a face to the unknown. Some people don't see a face. But those people that don't see a pay, is face in their subconscious wonder what if, it, what if it could have a face. And it's strange because... You can separate the design from the subtler design. What does that mean? That means as I'm looking at a clock right now, I can notice the idea of the clock is not the clock. But when I look at the clock, I, I have I've been conditioned to see instantly the concept of clock. Do you see? It's like we have, we have literally... Um, uh, lay, our mind has painted over all phenomenology through language. All uh, the inner realms are, are painting the outer realms into animate meaning. 
and the inner realms at, at their core are attributeless presence of attention. I, I termed this coin, uh, I coined this term, um, uh, what did I call it? Empty seeing. Empty seeing. You are seeing, but there is no content. You know you are there. It's like the knower without the content to know itself. So right now, there's something to look at for us to consider we are individuals. But it's wondering if the mind can reach a sophistication where it may not appear as an individual to itself. And I will tell you, many people from anyone who's been drawn to yoga, zen, or some sort of uh, you know, lo uh, love for the universe, they will know this. They will know this, that once you accept that you self is okay, and the world is okay, and the moment is okay, then you get to see who you are. So I would say honesty is a precondition to your actual life. And honesty doesn't mean ideological. It means honoring what is the real value of the moment, you know? Guys, I need a quick intermission. I'll be back. Blessings. Just a couple minutes.
okay. All right, guys, I got a bit recharged. Now I can, uh, we can continue. You know, I got tea, and there was a time where I thought, like, if I wanted to start a tea company, I will. I would probably call it either reality or emptiness. <laughs> It's like, who wants some empty, you know? <laughs> empty tea, you know? <laughs> so Charles says, anything outer can be employed as a metaphorical mirror of something inner. Outer circumstances reflect inner state of being. Uh, outer circumstances reflect inner state of being. Okay, fear can attract bully. Hardship can defeat or evoke compassion. You see, that's the thing. If if the outer can be employed as a metaphorical mirror of something inner, but the thing is, the thing is the outer. So if we are saying the outer is an inner phenomena, then there is actually no object to have a story for. I would say... Charles, on, as a response to your comment in the chat section, um, it goes beyond the language threshold. It's not um, the roots of truth are beyond duality. Does attention move without intent? Um, attention, you want to know my true view, that your attention has never moved. The, 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 the core of your attention, when I say you're an attributeless presence, in my school of thought, your attention is not a thing. At best, maybe consider it as an event. Things are in the attention, so we can't speak about the attention like it's a vehicle that does it move without a driver in it. Like, <clears throat> the attention is the presence of nature. It's the moment where energy will, became aware of itself. That's your attention. Your attention began the, from the subjective evolution. And it, it's separate from the, I would say, materialistic design. You know, it's it's like... We are in one side of the coin. Right now, things are way more materially stable than immaterial, immaterially. That means I find, like, I can hold my, this cup of tea in my hand uh, very easily. But when it comes to an idea, my attention has to engage with the idea or the idea moves away in my attention. So think about your inner realms as if you are scrolling a web browser and the web browser you can endlessly scroll, okay? And so if you don't stop for a second and engage and read the content, you would keep scrolling further and further and further. And so we can't define you as the website being scrolled. Do you know what I mean? Um, Charles, I'm, I'm trying to read your comment. Attention equals attending minus intent attending. Okay, let, let's make this easier. Just hang on for a second. Let me see how the dictionary decides the dis distinction between them. For me, at intent, there needs to be something. Okay, no, I could tell you. Attention is awareness. Intent is consciousness. Treat it that way, I would say. What does that mean? That means attention is non-local. Uh, attention is non-local. Intention is based on a location. There we go. There we go. That's, that, that's how I could say. That means your attention 
it you you can call it random but you can also call it nothing and it still is but your intent is usually based on some sort of future consideration so intention the difference between attention and intention is that time is solid time is solid that's why it's local so when you intend something you have a dimension of time and a dimension of space where you want a certain outcome but attention if attention was unknown like if, if we treat life like a dream where like the movie inception it's like where did it begin where did it end are we just in the middle of it in some coffee shop of human life like what <clears throat> what is this situation and the situation is that really our history we can't know nature has been so masterfully crafted that its secrets, their, its veils are very well placed. <clears throat> you know, I thought about what, what, what does it mean to have problems if it was in an illusion, in a simulation, or if it was in, in the truth. That means if this was just one truth of a reality. There was just one world. What would it mean to have a problem in oneness, you know, and a solution? <clears throat> and wondering what would it mean, in some sense, if there was no shape to the problem, yet the emotion was. Like, that. that's another complexity of emotion. Emotions are like, uh, you know what it is? Emotions are like helicopters. Thoughts are like cars. The, the, the helicopter has more of a devastation the higher it goes, more of a danger to it. That means emotions, when they intensify, they evoke great energy. Like, I can't tell you, there's been situations where I, even though I, I got angry and I managed to, you know, keep the, uh, uh, extinguish the flame of the anger, uh, anger behind my eyes, but it was a situation where I was like, why do I feel so energetic? when I got angry and I realized it, it the reason is is because there's been a cost to our civility the moment we left uh, uh, the natural environment the ecosystem think about it we were creatures living in the jungle then we're like hey man what's this concrete let's put concrete everywhere you know and so the concrete jungle began right now our psychologies are adjusting to a dulled down version of our biological animalistic senses that means we were wild but now we appreciate not physical wilderness and savageness we appreciate art that's what I've realized the mind only seeks the new it will seek the new till it realizes what it is You will treat this world like a vending machine where you think you got to do something specific and press something specific, you know, with a specific coin or a secret knowledge and then the vending machine is going to give you exactly what you want. If when you realize this universe has, un there's unknown variables and it's unpredictable, that's when it gets exciting. That's why I'm saying most human beings, they're bouncing off the unknown, not knowing how to confront it. But only the unknown can confront the unknown. So it's your declaration as an individual. Who are you? Are you a who? Or is it more unknown? And so it's the archaic revival of the unknown. The unknown is the backup system of a knowledge that is destroying itself. A known system, a system that is using knowledge that has given itself a certain story. The unknown is its only teacher. That means I was thinking, all right, how do you enlighten like a person? And then I was like, yeah, the yogis are like just, you know, pretty much the yogic advice. Like some kid went up to the yogi, imagine, and was like, how do I get enlightened? And the yogi was just like, kid, shut up and go and sit in a cave. Your mind will show you, you know. <clears throat> and the kid was like, okay, man, maybe a bit, be a bit discreet. <laughs> That's a playful story of animating, but the idea of it is that the mind is its own teacher when it can embrace its own unknown. When, you know, like, uh, you have to not only be comfortable with your objective realm, but you have to learn to be comfortable in certain subjective uh, states. And the only way you become comfortable is if you, this is where intention comes in, where you want to build something. I can tell you there is no 
it is one of the most uh, healing, liberated feelings on this planet to roar. Like, think of that line that thought it was a sheep, and the other line's like, bro, look at your face. You know, and the line looked at its face like, I see a sheep. And the line was like, look at my face and the reflection in the pond. And the line looks at the reflection of this other line, and it's like, oh my God, I'm a lion. This whole time I've been, you know, eating grass like a sheep, but I'm a lion. So that's the ability of the mind. The lion is your potential. Being the sheep is how much you have entrusted yourself. So distrust leads you into being a sheep. Trusting yourself, that's the only way you can strengthen your mind. You think a soldier on a battlefield, you have to trust the weapon in your hand. It doesn't matter what the outcome is. You have to trust. You have to have, you have to, like when two opponents fight in any combat, the first thing, if the opponents are smart, the first thing they look at is, is each other's eyes. They want to see how intense that warrior is going to fight. And when you see the intensity in the eyes of the unknown, then knowledge has its own moves. There's been times where in my inner realms, I've had a geometrical translation of memory. What does that mean? That means imagine yourself as a child uh, look, remembering a time you saw a shape, any shape, square, triangle, um, circle, whatever. That means your memory in that moment, as you as a kid, imagine you drew a shape on a piece of paper and you're remembering that shape on that piece of paper. That literally means your memory is geometric in that instant. That means a memory of geometry means the memory is geometric. And so when you notice that the subtler realms, the inner realms, can have a geometrical translation, the only mystery comes, as Carl Jung said, how, how is it uh, sometimes that the theosophists, the the, okay, so theosophy is a branch of knowledge where people are wondering about other dimensions and whatever. You know, <clears throat> certain theoretical physicists, if they wonder, let's say they're wondering about parallel dimensions, the moment they wonder if there's aliens in those parallel dimensions, you can say that they can communicate to, you can say that they're looking at things from a the theosophist angle, theosophical angle, okay? That means human beings have not just been trying to communicate with normal human beings with visible phenomena, they have also uh, attempted communication with invisible phenomena, but then there was Carl Jung, Carl Jung came and said something incredible and he said there is the unconscious mind. That means what we thought was like another being in another dimension is actually an autonomous sort of movement of the unconscious. That means it's like you think you're small so you think there is a big entity. Well when you realize you're big then you see a lot of small entities. Then you wonder wait a minute so which one am I? Am I the big or the small? You see, you're beyond size. Your eyes are their own lord. You know, for me, there was something that was a very hard decision to make. And that decision was, if I, if the mind <clears throat> is appearing as a multidimensional context to a single in, uh, ob objective concept, that means I'm looking at my body right now and I'm like, what is this? You know, that what is this makes me see parallel variables of what it could be. Just by just seeing, by just noticing that your mind is the multidimensional angle <clears throat> and your body is the singular angle and that life is appearing as an oscillation between the multidimensional and the singular and even the void but the void and the singular they they have a multidimensional relationship too so you could say um for an infinite okay here i'll say it like this for a void being uh enlightenment is the singular or let me say it like this let me say it like this for an infinite being, duality is an enlightenment. For, for a dualistic creature, 
oneness is an enlightenment. For a, for a being of oneness, the void is an enlightenment. For the void, infinite is the enlightenment. And the circle repeats. It repeats. That means where can the infinite go? To the void. Or to the dualistic. All dimensions are sandwiched by two other dimensions. Right now, if, if, we, if, if I'm, I'm speaking as an individual and you're listening to me as an individual, we are entertaining a dualistic linguistic simulation. Okay, so there are, it, our, our, our plane of existence is sandwiched. It's sandwiched by two other dimensions. Okay, it's sandwiched by, a dual, uh, by an infinite dimension. That's one exit out of the duality, exit and entrance. And what, another exit and entrance is the singularity. So in this life, you'll notice those people who've suffered as individuals, they've, they wanted to release the suffering. So those who went to the Buddhic path, they're like, who's suffering? And through a comprehension of the void, they understood the singularity of the moment to no longer have a fragmentation of time to suffer, to have a comparative suffering, you know? Sometimes a person suffers when they are conscious of something. Sometimes a person may suffer with something that's completely unconscious to them. There's been days that I've just been walking and suddenly I felt sad. And I had no idea. Literally, there was no... I was just in a moment. I was just standing somewhere. But the emotion of this sadness had found me. Do you know? And I don't know what it was. It was a mystery. For me, there's many mysteries in my life. You know, this is why I found a contentment uh, with moving as, as a linguistic entity. Because I realize it's too unknown. That's why we have the endless freedom to explore it. And nobody can stop you unless the you stop yourself first. And that's the reason. I'm not saying nobody can stop you as a sort of inspirational, like, yo, man, hard work till the end of time. No, 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 no. It's not just hard work because there's intelligence as a dimension in the system. So it's smart. It's, it's being smart before you work hard. But being smart means wondering where the value of the moment is and wondering where the value of the moment is at the end of it comes down to a certain range of what you are envisioning in the moment and what the moment is envisioning in you. What I mean by this is that, again, like Michelangelo, he says, I, I saw the angel in the stone and I set it free. So it's kind of like the human free will is looking at the world like a stone and sculpting meaning into uh, in it. And at the same time, the world is moving the individual. So I could say the world is physically sculpting me and I am non-physically sculpting the world. The world is objectively sculpting the self. The self is subjectively sculpting the world. Booyah! There we go. That's, that's the relationship. I'll tell you... <laughs> I'll tell you, like, that's, that's it. That's it. It's a simultane simultaneous, it's, it appears as one event, but it's the simultaneous movement of self and world and world and self. And when we can study this, when we can have it, I think the educational system in the future should have just two branches, you know, known studies and unknown studies, you know, <laughs> you know, and all. There can be endless an endless list of different topics, you know, because education is very complex. Usually people, they, you ask them, why do you want to get educated? It's a skill-oriented expectation of their future self. But if education, if we cared for knowledge for the sake of knowledge, because only when we care for knowledge for the sake of knowledge, the future generations win, you know? <sighs> Louis Holland. Do we have free will? Um, there's, um, I remember Christian, uh, Christopher Hitchens was asked this and he's like, you have no choice. <laughs> you have no choice. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but, well, I, I, I'll tell you this. Um, I would say you have freedom which can arise as your will. There's freedom of observance, reg regardless of the form. It's, there's, it's like, you know what it is? It's like, an, uh, it's like an unconditional, intelligent observer from a higher dimension uh, living through the conditional 
uh, object and subjects of observance of this dimension. That means we're neither objects, we're neither subjects. These are just the Iron Man suits we wear to appear as individuals to each other. In reality, energy at its purest conscious state is just raw attention. So there is a view that we want to react to the individualism of being like, oh man, it's, it, we suffer when we're individuals. Maybe we should all be just this collective jello of love and energy, you know? But on another, on another angle, you're like, wait a minute, maybe the universe has never had this opportunity to arise this way you know and we should we should have the nobility of feeling that we may of course we're temper te our physical um what do you call it um as creatures we're temporary yet we should have the honor of thinking we're creating an eternal memory the way we live is the memory of the future self of the cosmos we're designing its memory. Just think about it this way. Right now, the way your decisions right now, it's as if you are a memory, you are sculpting the memory of your future self based on how you live now. Now I'm saying like, based on how 8 billion creatures live right now on a rock, we are sculpting the memory of the future civilization. So you might not believe it. If you just care for something, you're going to find the, the it's like the heavens notice you. But if you don't care for anything in this life, you're going to notice something very hilarious. The moment you stop caring for your world, who do you think is the next victim? Yourself. You stop caring for the world in front of your eyes, you'll stop caring for the self that's in that world. So be careful. Whoever goes towards mysticism, I say mysticism isn't for the faint of heart. Even though we're trying to comprehend intelligence through space and matter, not just obsessed with the material movement as just the evidence for space. Do you know that means we can think of matter as the smaller layer, onion layer, like you see an onion, you know, like the smaller layer of the onion. You know, that means space could be a greater onion layer of intelligence, potentially. We don't know. But there is this idea that space is the only thing that's moving, expanding faster than light. Or stretching faster than light. So here's the thing, guys. We have free will on this planet. It's just that it appears in a circumstance. That means right now, if you don't, for example, eat food, the question, do I have a free will? Well, you're going to stop existing to have free will. You know, if you stop eating food or if you, if you don't care for your biological program, it'll start happening. Stop, it, it won't be energized. Luli says, what does a healthy relationship with our past selves look like? Should we have regrets? How can we learn to understand mysterious choices? Okay, those are three incredible questions. Let me tell you. First, second question, easiest to answer. Should we have regrets? Never. The past is past. What are you regretting? It's done. You saw the film. It's over. You're, you're walking past to the next uh, cinema booth. Like what, what, you know what I mean? The past is past. That's the easiest way to confront your past. It's done. It's been passed. It's past you. <laughs> You've passed your past, you know? <laughs> or your past is past you. Or what I mean by that is you've, you've experienced your past. It's done. It's like you wrote those sentences on the piece of paper. Now, the th now you say, what does a relationship with our past selves look like? That's a present question. You know, <clears throat> so should we have regrets? It's another way of you saying, how should we look at the past? I'm saying the past is past. Uh, uh, and, and then you say, what does a healthy relationship with our past selves look like? Your past selves were living for your future self. So if you live for your past selves, your past selves are going to be like, what the fuck, man? We've been trying to get you to the future self. The future self is looking at its past. You know, you better look at your future self. That means it's like we shouldn't nullify 
the value of the individual idea of the human being in the future because we all want to go to a new age here and now also like we shouldn't we shouldn't nullify the value of the human individual regardless of how spiritual or physical or metaphysical the landscape is you know it's like the, i'm saying when we treat humanity as an event the event can have a merit of intelligence on its own so i'm saying it's like an unknown event where we know certain range of it you know robert m persick this guy was like the human awareness is like you get a handful of sand from this endless speech it's endless there's so much there's so much it's like you're you're not uh, you're not the whole cosmos atomically you're just your body for example atomically like the, your free will like you don't have the free will to tell the earth to move the other way but you could turn your head the other way you know what i mean like free will is in 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 conditions and in ranges and <clears throat> actually people who work those people who are really working uh, in, in the engines of society and civilization, they are actually working to experience greater dimensions of their free will. You know, because if everybody was free, nothing would update. People would have no, no, nothing throughout the day challenging them to give them meaning. There, there, there is no, so Charles, Charles, <laughs> Charles says those who don't learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. Yeah, I know, I'm familiar with that saying, but I'll tell you, they're not doomed. They're doomed if their attention is on doom, uh, on the past. Let me tell you this, think of your attention as a space, as like a, f a car, like, you know, as if like five people can fit in the car properly. You know, think of your attention as like a vehicle with a certain space, okay? So if you occupy the space of your vehicle with the past ideas, the past will drive you. Think of like, you. there's five people in a car and four of them are the ideas of the past and one of them is the idea of the future. Where do you think that vehicle has been going to drive? It's going to drive to the past. People are going to be like, yeah, man, let's go back to the past, you know? But I'm telling you, out those people who are interested about the future, those people are actually the ones who actually care for the present. You can't, You. I, I would say, if you just come to the present moment and nullify yourself into oneness, you care your it's as if you cared for your past but if if you if in that oneness you you have no contribution greater than a tree to your civilization then i would say it's missing out on an opportunity of a lifetime uh so louis says i can't understand free will <sighs> There probably should be a song written, you're not the only one. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> let me tell you, free will, I mean, it might be easier to understand it if your name was Will and you were seeking freedom, but... <laughs> free will is opportunity. I would define it simply as that. Free will is an op is a, a evolutionary biological rare occurrence in this universe that should be utilized and should be seen like it's a brush in your hand, but it's a divine brush. You know, you can use it. <laughs> Charles says, harmonizing the perspective of the mind with the attitude of the heart activates the intent of the will. Whoa. Yeah, man, I think you, you already have the Elder Scroll in your hand, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, anyways, I'm just trying to zoom in on what does it mean to make a choice. The implication of a choice in the outer realm is the authorization of the inner realm to express. Like, I had to choose to click the button of this live stream, you know. <laughs> Mm. 
You see, when the human being can honor the self equally as they honor the world, I feel the, the pilot will have no karmic turbulence. So that's the thing. The Stoics understood this. Stoicism, Marcus Aurelius was a great Stoic. Marcus Aurelius, this conqueror, <clears throat> and he says the soul is dyed with the color of its thoughts. Stoic wisdom, uh, even from the likes of Epictetus, he says we suffer not from we suffer not from the events in our lives. We suffer from uh, but from the judgments we have about them. You don't suffer because something happens. You suffer because what that what that occurrence implies to you. So this is, the Stoics understood this, this behavioralism, even though Stoicism, I mean, you got to understand people were savage back in the day, but like, uh, like, a, <laughs> you know, I mean, but there, I, they, there was a significance to their efforts, you know, that they said that it's a behavioral alg algorithm. That means not all of life is just an in intellectual kind of like rational calculation. It's also how you are go playing along in the, in, in the play. In the play of elements, in a, it, 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 as an event, you know, event, surely. <laughs> the mind is, of course, space. What else can it be? You know, I don't, I don't know so anybody who can hold their mind in their hand. It's like, go ask this. Go ask this from your psychology professor be like uh, sir can you show me the mind and the psychology professor is like what is there to show and that's my point it takes our attention to the invisible unknown movement of the world and that's the uncharted territory and that's the forest that we need to explore as a species the forest behind our eyes that we can activate inner realms, that every story, every, the entertainment industry is based on the inner realm of the person. So you see, for me, I, I found it hilarious that I, when I attended Toronto Film School, and in that, they weren't inspiring creativity. They were inspiring skill, yet not realizing the value of the industry was based on the creative idea. So I can tell you that uh, not all systems are kind, even though they may appear, you know, or let me say it, not all systems uh, created by mankind are kind, you know, that's when you know uh, an institution is healthy, when it actually sees the outside world more than itself. Any institution that sees itself, that has an ego, trust me, institutions have egos, you can say the religion was, was how a group of people had one type of ego. You know, that's the thing about ideology. Soon we will hear the roars of the philosophers, you know. There's going to be in the future some children that will open their eyes that I was just fathoming in my inner realms. I'm like, we, should, we shouldn't fear anything. Let me tell you why. The, the more messed up problems we see out there, the more deep down subconsciously the urge to solve it comes. So as human beings procreate, they are actually creating efforts for the solution. So what, what it is, is right now we have to just catalyze uh, or accelerate uh, the globalization process and some people are going to be like you, you, what's it within no what would that mean for cultural identity what would that mean on a on a long term in regards to um us valuing different nations and different cultures and let me tell you what it would mean it would mean we can't ignore the future regardless of how hard we try so if we can't ignore it let's run to it and advance a bit quicker before our eyes return back to the dirt that's for me that for me it's like that's an advanced civilization where the eyes open and they see it i'm telling you there is something there's a vision that every human being has to find for themselves i i said it, it's the love of the species hopefully you're blessed enough to find this in your life you know find this emotion that i you're blessed enough for this uh, emotion like a butterfly to land on your shoulder and let me tell you what this emotion is. This emotion is when you 
It's, believe it or not, strangely, profoundly, divinely egoic. Let me tell you why. It's that feeling of, you know how some, when you see like your sibling or your close friend or your loved one being uh, bothered, you know, and suddenly you go to their, you guard them, you defend them. It's like a feeling where you see after 4 billion years, this is the torch passed down, regardless of how comfortable or uncomfortable it is. And then you see this small species on a rock and nature is bullying it, time is bullying it, ignorance is bullying it, chaos is bullying it, savageness and blindness is bullying it. And so you see, you see it's like this rare flame, this small flame after four billion years kept lit and winds, winds of ignorance are trying to make this, this little flame go out. And that's when the roar comes. That's when you want to defend your civilization like it's your sibling. Like it's your, it's, it, you know, it's like it's your goddamn home. What else you got? What else you got other than these creatures on this rock? Inner realm, inner realm joys of another dimension, those can wait. You know, I, 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 I respect all the ideology as beautiful artwork. But I'll tell you this. The artwork at the right time to see it is beautiful. That means pol pol political systems being uh, possessed uh, by 6th century ideology is scary. That means I, it was this idea where, I don't know, an idea must have a human assisting it or the idea can start devouring the moment. Ideas should be treated as like they need to have a leash on them. Do you know that means when we think of, let's say, in the <laughs> that means we have to be introduced to the ideas. Not I because in this world it's a random generator of factors, isn't it? We're like random intelligent patterns. We're like every human being is like a different signal of what a human being can be. We are different synapses of humanity's future mind sometimes I feel like a pillar I feel like a stone column it's a very strange <laughs> you know like the stone columns they had in the school of Athens you know <laughs> I remember I gave a talk it's called wisdom of the hidden pillar where I was like, there are some expressions of intelligence on this planet that they don't have a narrative purpose. They're just here to be, just to keep uh, the show going. Because history is like a microphone and every person who's alive and born on this planet, you have that microphone. It's just that you have to care for the world. When a person cares more about themselves and they do an action, they will always have regret and guilt. But if you actually care more for the world, try a selfless day for once, you'll be fascinated of your how gentle and smooth the, the ripples on, like there will be less ripples on your inner realms, on the pond of your mind, pondering throughout the day, you know? Guys, I'm going to go into a quote tunnel of a very profound mystic. To me, he feels like a comrade on the same battlefield. Um, a Lebanese poet named Khalil Gibran. And uh, I'm going to read a bunch of his quotes for you. This is the quote tunnel segment of the show.
Let's see. Khalil Gibran says, Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They came through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. There's more to that poem, by the way. You know, <laughs> this is just a different sight. Khalil Gibran says, We choose our joys and sorrows long before we experience them. <clears throat> Khalil Gibran says, Hallow the body is a temple to comeliness and sanctity. The heart is a sacrifice to love. Love recompenses the adorers. All right, I'm going to just casually walk past that quote. <laughs> Kill Gibran says, I love you when you bow in your mosque, kneel in your temple, pray in your church, for you and I are sons of one religion, and it is the spirit. Khalil Gibran says, where is the justice of political power? If the execute, if the execute, exe if it executes the murder and jails the plunder, and then itself marches upon neighboring lands, killing thousands and pillaging the very hills. Khalil Gibran says, I existed from all eternity, and behold, I am here, and I shall exist till the end of time, for my being has no end. Khalil Gibran says, poverty is a veil that obscures the face of greatness. An appeal is a mask covering the face of tribulation. Khalil Gibran says, when love beckons you, follow him through his ways. Oh, sorry. Though, guys, you got to know something. Khalil Gibran was a mystic. Oftentimes when in Rumi's poetry, Attar, Hafez, uh, Kayyam, Maybe not so much Kayyam, but, 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 but like different poets, Khalil Gibran, these guys were speaking in their poetry. There is the dialogue of, they are speaking through the eyes of, uh, believe it or not, the God of the moment. So when they say follow him uh, or he or the beloved, these are all the same terms suggesting to some uh, a collective mind. When love beckons to you, follow him, though his ways are hard and steep. And when his wings enfold, you yield to him, though the sword hidden among his pinions may wound you. I think there's some sort of angelic imagery. Kilijaman says, if you love somebody, let them go. For if they return, they were always yours. And if they don't, they never were. Yeah. Imagine saying this quote in a nightclub. <laughs> It's like, I don't know if Khalil Gibran, like, <laughs> ever partied after midnight, you know, probably. <laughs> Khalil Gibran says, Your living is determined not so much by what life brings to you as by the attitude you bring to life. Not so much by what happens to you as by what your mind looks at what, ha at what happens. <clears throat> Khalil Gibran says, But let there be spaces in your togetherness, and let the winds of the heavens dance between you. Love one another, but make not a bond of love. Let it rather be a moving sea between the shores of your souls. And that means the biggest component of love is that you can't chase it because there is an unknown element to it. And when you chase it, you devoid yourself of an, of an alertness to the unknown. You don't see the signs of how your mind is dancing in the world, you know, the tune it's dancing to in the world. Kilijabron says, 
Uh, um, I read that. He says, when we turn to one another for counsel, we reduce the number of our enemies. And that's exactly an algorithm. Like this is this quote is too incredible not to comment on. <clears throat> Khalil Gibran is saying, if you treated your neighbor as a friend, there may be a less potential for enemies. That means being friendly reduces uh, inefficiency. That means the least you can people can do on this planet. It doesn't. It doesn't mean people have to be polite, but be a bit friendly. Let your let the edifice of the social construct projected in the moment walk friend calmly. You know, there's a beauty to this world that can the viol that the violent can never see. So you got to renounce the violent, and that's it. Everybody can pick up a sword in any moment, and everybody can let go of a sword in every moment. That's how it happens. You know, you, you renounce your suffering, really. <laughs> what else can you do with suffering? You know, you can play with it like a basketball, you know, emotionally play with it like a basketball, or you can just be like, all right, I experience this part of the mountain. Let me go see what else the climb has to offer. And so that, that really is it. That, that's the only way I could tell people, especially, especially some of the celebrities and you see in you know, Western civilization, they have to come to terms and they have to allow themselves to be uh, the writers of their own script. That means this may sound strange, but like I studied film directing and I can tell you, but I thought about it, some of the best films can actually be made if the actor, if, if like, do, you don't know what, it, what I mean by that. Some of the greatest directors can only be actors, I feel. Do you know? Because, because there, is, there is something about seeing a vision in your inner realm, which the director sees and the actor sees a vision in their inner realm, But the thing is that the actor knows how real, knows way more how, how much more real that scene can come to life than, let us say, the director's position. Because it's, there's one thing about wondering how another person will embody a character and there's one thing about wondering how you would embody that character, you know? So I think they should take turns. Actors should start uh, directing and all the directors in Hollywood should start acting. <laughs> Somebody, you know, um, be a pigeon and, you know, send this message somewhere. You know? <laughs>
That means I don't care if you're a, you're a small kid or if you're an old man. If you see a problem and you can identify it's a problem, attend to it. The civilization is like a giant boat. Do you know how many times I've picked up trash that wasn't mine? And I didn't pick it up for the p people or anything. I picked it up because I'm like, is this the type of city I deserve? Do you know there's a thing about, there's a difference between throwing trash, which I'm guilty of doing too, but, but I'm saying there's a, di there's a difference between throwing trash, there's a difference between uh, seeing the trash and walking past it, and there's a difference between seeing the trash and picking it up. And so most human beings, if they are self-obsessed, they will be blind to actually the help the civilization needs from them. That means it's like most people are like, what is the meaning of life? Build this damn civilization before you leave. That's it. <laughs> that's, the, that's the meaning of life, I would tell you. There is no greater game to play on this rock in the middle of nowhere, on this pebble in a light beam, than to build an advanced civilization. I, I am willing to argue endless people on this. Do you know? <laughs> Ad infinitum, you know, debate. But I'll tell you, it, this is the ultimate idea. I was looking for this idea for so long. You don't know. It's been like, it was like more than six years, seven years. I've been seeking the ultimate idea, and then I, it, it was first like a metaphysical leap into the inner realms. Then I, land, I, I went to the peak of the inner realms, and I'm like, all right, oneness doesn't have much to do. You know? <laughs> And then I, I, I noticed that the individual and its participation in the event of civilization is the important thing. Because let me tell you, everything, every object in this world of light has a shadow. It doesn't matter, you call it science, philosophy, religion, spirituality, trust me, they all, everything has had a shadow. You know, everything has had unknown variables that have, that have implied a different meaning of it. You know, that means systems have appeared ordered, suddenly appeared chaotic. But all systems also have appeared chaotic and have been ordered, you know. Trust me, we can see ordered people and we can also see chaotic people. And chaos has a karma too. Chaos is karma is between honest chaos and dishonest chaos. And then we have uh, honest order and dishonest order. Dishonest order is still better than honest chaos. Because the creature is respecting the system that is our home. Like imagine this rock being an island and civilization being what we made on it. That means I, it's like looking at the film Castaway and being like, oh man, what a tough life. You know, I'm happy I'm not in that situation. Then being like, wait a minute, I'm on a rock in a, uh, on a giant island in space. You know? <laughs> we have more resources though. And so we have to learn to live as minds, especially in, in the next coming 30 years. I would say whoever you are, if my voice has uh, found you, communicate and don't fear your inner realms. The inner realms, if you fear it, nothing happens. It just comes and goes. But if you trust it, then inspiration is synced with external expression. That means it's like would a dwell, like it's, it's a very very complex idea like are warriors happy to be under one administration or would the warriors be happy each being their own administer depends on the time anyways let's go back to the code tunnel Khalil Gibran says, Yesterday we obeyed kings and bent our necks before emperors, but today we kneel only to truth, follow only beauty, and obey only love. That's an incredible thought. That what was the concept of royalty became the significance of attention to the values in life. 
That means the archetype of the king was an intermediary to the individual accepting or honoring love. Khalil Gibran says, if you cannot work with love, but only with distaste, it is better that you should leave your work. Khalil Gibran says, you give but little when you give of your possessions. It is when you give of yourself that you truly give. Khalil Gibran says, zeal is a volcano, the peak of which the grass of indecisiveness does not grow. Khalil Gibran says, are you a politician asking what your country can do for you, or a zealous one asking what you can do for your country? If you are the first, then you are a parasite. If the second, then you are an oasis in the desert. Whoa. What does he mean by that? Oh, I think he's saying that you're not seeing both sides of the coin, so you're lost either way. Khalil says, life without love is like a tree without blossoms or fruit. Khalil Gibran says, art is a step from what is obvious and well known toward what is arcane and concealed. That's a good quote. There has to be, I'm telling you, the unknown is necessary in anything. Without the unknown, the person doesn't even feel alive. You don't feel like you know anything if there wasn't an unknown. <laughs> Um, Dorian says culture is not your friend so Terence McKenna there you should check out some of the academic literature on chaos it will deepen your understanding of the term let me tell you it's uh, that it's not a term if you understand chaos as a term that means it's like you're reading about horse riding rather than realizing it's there's a reality to it there's a realness to it you know You know, it's not an idea. Language can, and them not realizing that some ideas, they were experiences. And the experiential domain is very different. But um, Dorian, in the chat section, if you have suggestions on certain books, if you have a book suggestion, like a book list in mind, or some liter specific literature, share it so the 17 people also sing and also use it or something. So I think it's a good place to share. I mean, uh, chaos, I, I engage the idea from, honestly, it's like, it's a view on the origin of the world. That's the ancient Greek notion. You know, that from chaos the order began. You know, even the ancient Greeks would say to tame the savageness of man and make gentler the life of this world. You can say chaos is the lack of order or the absence of order. So to actually read literature about chaos, you're reading randomity because chaos is not bound to an order. So I really don't know what can be written about chaos too much aside from its metaphorical value, for example, in mythology and whatnot. Pretty much the whole thing is between the known and the unknown. I will tell you all of knowledge is divided between the known and unknown variables and unknown variables. When there's more unknown variables, the reality becomes more theoretical. When there is more known variables, the theory becomes more real. You know, the hypothesis can be accepted more as a theory. So, th so, there's, so there's various approaches, I feel. But um, I'm going to read one more quote, actually, from Khalil Gibran. And he says, work is love made visible. And if you cannot work with love, but only... Oh my god, I read this. What is this?
Khalil Gibran says the eye of a human being is a microscope which makes the world seem bigger than it really is. Khalil Gibran says all that spirits desire, spirits attain. Wow. That means if you feel you have unconditional authorization in, in your inner realms, your, the outer realms will reflect that. You know, when Terence McKenna said culture is not your friend, honestly, culture and society was the way I got introduced to Terence McKenna uh, and his work. He had this talk where he, he said culture is not, ideology is not your friend. And it was such a, um, you can say, vision opening lecture he has, and I uploaded it on my channel. Uh, he has this very incredible lecture where when he says ideology is not your friend, it means you are living in a system that potentially has not seen you, but is trying to administer you. So right now, it's this feeling like the people who are the members of the civilization don't really see the faces of the governing powers, and the governing powers are not really seeing the faces of the people that are governing. This is why in the future, AI is going to become the government. We're just going to have, we're just going to realize it's about decision making based on information because the presidents that we're choosing, you need, uh, let me tell you, there's, there's a trend in the film industry <clears throat> that it's as if the technology is increasing to a point where actors may never need to act actually, that from all the other films they've acted in, they could generate the actor, you know, with tech, uh, with a certain, you know, high level software, let's say, but I'm telling you. It's like the same where as that re it suddenly makes it le the physical actor no longer necessary when the actor can become like a computer program and can act in any movie. That means we could get all the greatest actors of the world in the same movie and they don't have to even act. You know, that could be the future of the film industry. But I'm telling you, <clears throat> so the same way that is getting rid of the need for an actor, I feel... Um, How would I say it? The same way a politician is no longer going to be needed when a computer can make better decisions. I mean, Hitchhiker's, Hitch, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy kind of predicted this when all the beings were waiting for the robot to give them an answer to the meaning of life. That means machine intelligence was seen way superior than the human mind, you know? So it's fascinating. Just like how cars are getting automated in the future, civilization is getting automated. Governments may get automated in the future. Who knows? Everything may get automated, you know. That's why I'm saying we have to care for how we live as minds in a, in a world that is uh, the, many of the labor jobs in the future may uh, may not kind of be accessible if robots. Like think of yourself as an entrepreneur. Would you rather have people um, uh, manufacture your products or robots that never get tired? You just have to pay the electric bill, you know. So you're going to see robots are going to come and replace labor because it's the obvious decision. It's like the, it's the, you know, it's an advantage. It's a comparative advantage when, especially businesses that compete with one another. So it's fascinating whether we look at it a natural approach, the collective being means the automation of individuals rhythmically by the intent of one rhythm. So you know, it's, it's like the game designer making a game and for a second being like, wait a minute, I kind of feel like God to these video game characters. You know, and then the person wonders about reality and it's like, oh my God. <laughs> Who's playing this game of life behind our eyes? Who's sitting 
at the computer desk in which the character in the video game cannot see. So choices are important, you know. I, I, I feel it's uh, basically self, uh, the simplest way we can kind of see this idea is that self and world again. And as there is a self and a world, now the self can be conscious of the world. Before we couldn't do that. Now we can. That's our blessing as a species. We became conscious of the world. That means we found a way to take a responsibility. We started doing something for ourselves that nature was doing all along. So if we stop doing it, we will feel nature is doing it. If we keep doing it, we will feel we're doing it. And that's why I'm saying e the ego is not evil. It is just like an egg, as someone said. It's like an egg. How? If the egg breaks from the outside, there's no life. If the egg breaks from within, there is life. If you realize who you are from the outside, your ego is going to just, you're going to feel like emptiness. But, it, <laughs> but if you realize it from just the strange presence of your own eyes, then what can I say? You become, as Rumi says, you be living poetry. You will be living poetry. You will be the same effort, that same energy, the, the same beauty the poet was seeing in the sentence structure, the same beauty you will see in your whole moment as an event. You know, so there's one strategy, people are like, all right, in the future, I want this, I'm going to run towards this. And then there's a strategy where the person's like, let me see, let me see, because there's endless moments. It's like an all you can eat buffet of various experiences, you know. Charles says, self and world is the twin poles of the continuum of life. As, as the, uh, we're oscillating. We're oscillating between feeling the world is moving the self and the self moving the world. In the dream state, you feel the world is moving yourself, really. You know? Oh, sorry, sorry. In the dream state, you feel yourself, your mind is moving the world. You know? But in the outer states, like your, it's a, your physical conditions, it's like if it rains, you're going to go inside. Guess what? The world just moved you, you know? <laughs> We have to use the tools at hand, like a survivor on an island of manifestation, you know. Fear nothing for, there's nothing really to fear, you can't, it's like, there's, there's nothing. <laughs> it's like nothing is nothing, don't worry about it. <laughs> It's like they went to the Buddha, you know, like a buddy of Buddha, I imagine, back in the day. Like a chill guy went to Buddha. And it's like, Buddha, what's the truth about it? And Buddha's like, nothing. It's like, what do you mean nothing? It's like, nothing, man. It's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, technically, the word nothing is like you put a space between the O and the T and it's no thing. The more complex we see the world, the more uncontrollable it can become, of course. That means there are certain states of mind where the, the complexity can go out in infinitum. It's like the moment the person feels weak, you can feel incredibly like you can, your mind can endlessly make you feel like every moment of your life you were weak, you know. Or if you were, if you're strong in one moment, you're going to feel like in every moment of your life you were strong. It's just, it's just, um, I'm telling you, so much of life is not just... It's about observance and then action. And that observance is the mind, the ripples of the mind settling then through the clear surface of the pond movement arising. So this is the value of your mind. It is really the intelligent part of the moment. <laughs> so anyways, guys, um, 
Thanks for uh, tuning in. I guess I'll end the talk here. Let me see what did I write in the subtitle. Yeah, the invisible other. Yeah, if you think you're the visible self, then of course the invisible is going to be the other. You're going to feel something different than you is going to be other. <laughs> That means if we were invisible beings right now, that we would be talking about the visible other, you know. <laughs> but because we we are visible creatures, we're talking about the invisible other. What if you know? What if there was something else, you know? So, guys, um, thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm gonna share a discord link here and uh, Q&A can happen in the discord link So anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. The talk has ended at this point, but the stream is going to continue so people can find the Discord if they want to. Blessings. Thanks for listening.